Northern Brewery takes you where home brewing and craft brewing meet. From pro breweries to home breweries, we live and breathe beer. Craft beer celebrities, homebrew luminaries, brew sessions, and most important of all, lots of great beer. You are watching Brewing TV. Hello everybody, I am Chip Walton. I'm Grant Chose. We're from Northern Brewer. And this is Brewing, Brewing TV. TV. Full disclosure, everything you're about to see, not everything, but the middle part of this episode you're about to see, yeah. we shot thinking would be included in the cider episode that came out a couple of weeks ago. But this is such a radical concept that we figured we would just outboard it and make it its own episode. So <laughs> the big question we're going to answer today is what do beer, apple cider, Stephen King, and the internet homebrewing culture... And time in, travel. And time travel have in common graph what you're about to see is a very interesting mashup of what happens when you mix an apple cider and beer wort we're getting a little bit closer back to home brewing here but we definitely still have apple cider on the brain we're going to take you back to about a year ago when grant and i in this very backyard brewed up his version of a graph we're going to meet you on the other side of that and we're going to talk about this one that we're holding. Neither of us made this one. This is a BTV fans graph. It's very evil looking. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about it. But first things first, let's make some graph. All for brew. Brew for all. Graph for all. Graph. Graph for all. Back here at Grant's house, we're doing something a little more epic, uh, as in a book series. <laughs> Tell us about what we're making. Okay, um, so maybe about two years ago I got really addicted to the Stephen King book series, The Dark Tower, and uh, uh, it takes place on another world, but uh, in that world they don't really drink beer, uh, rather they drink graph. Um, and it, it's basically described as like a, a, a dark ale with a multi head but it's made out of apples. Well I thought, oh, that's really cool, I wonder if anyone's tried to brew this. Well, uh, lo and behold, at uh, homebrew uh, talk for, uh, uh, forums, uh, there was an entry by Brandon O, uh, who has kind of perfected the recipe, actually, of uh, making this stuff called graph. What we're going to be doing is uh, having a gallon boil uh, that we're going to start off, actually, with a steep of uh, half a pound of uh, crystal grains and uh, an ounce or two of torrified wheat. Um, this is just to kind of give uh, that one gallon of wort the body and feel of beer uh, and the torrified wheat is just to kind of give it a little bit more of a nice thick head to it. After we have the steeping grains we're going to be adding in one pound of amber DME and uh, I'm going to do another pound of dark DME just to kind of play around with the color. You can really use, I, in the past I've used uh, mostly just plain light DME. After we get that to boil though uh, we're going to have a 30 minute boil uh, with a half an, uh, half an ounce of uh, crystal um, hops, uh, something in the mid-acidity range. Uh, the people usually are uh, sitting around 7 to 11 percent on that. Um, but I've always had uh, uh, good luck with uh, the lower end uh, of the crystal uh, hops. So on seeing the uh, fact that the Alpha is actually a 2.8 on this crystal, uh, I'm just going to throw the whole thing in there. I always make little uh, hop balls uh, for the boils, um, you know, I, I was never told to do this by anyone. I just like it because it's just easier to scoop it out of the wart and uh, throw it away later on, and it keeps a little bit of the mess out of the wart when you're throwing in the uh, fermenter. So that's nice. We're just going to be taking that wart, cooling it down really fast. It won't take long though because it's only a gallon, and then we throw that on top of. Uh, four gallons of fresh pressed cider. It's really good stuff. I'm really excited to uh, make graph. Uh, so this is the fresh pressed uh, apple cider that I just got the other day, um, but I actually don't know what variety this is. Um, I just know this fresh pressed uh, apple cider from southern Wisconsin. That said, uh, taste it because apple cider is good. That is really sweet. Not that tart at all, actually. I'm really excited to see how this ferments away. I would say that there's like a honey crisp uh, sort of sweetness to it though. Um, there's a little bit of tartness on it. Originally I was thinking that it, it reminded me of a Fuji apple, but now that I'm tasting it again, it really doesn't. It really reminds me of the honey crisp altogether. I usually only use the frozen canned stuff uh, that you get at the supermarket, 
Um, usually for a five gallon batch, I use about 13 cans of just Roundy's good old apple cider. <laughs> but it, this is really fun stuff and you can really play around with the recipe a lot. It doesn't really fall as a proper beer uh, in, in any way, shape or form. So uh, whatever you do, you're probably doing it right. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. There's no wrong way to do this, right? No. I mean, it's, it's a fictional drink. Yeah. How are people, how, from what you could tell in the forums, how have people come up with, are they utilizing the tasting, the description of the look and taste in the fiction to kind of fine tune it? Yeah, so the stuff that, um, uh, that I brew mostly is based off a of Brandon O's recipe, which really doesn't look or feel like what Stephen King was uh, uh, describing in the book, but rather it was just kind of inspired by uh, the Stephen King. But if uh, you dig around on the internet, um, be it homebrew talk forums, I know uh, the Reddit homebrewing community, there's a lot of people who have played around with this recipe. You can really tweak it to make it look like something that uh, Gimli himself would be proud to drink. I've played with different uh, yeasts. Most people uh, are using uh, probably Nottingham uh, yeast, just the dry packet Nottingham. Yeah. Uh, myself, I like to use 1056. Right now I have on tap uh, another batch that I didn't use torrified weed in. I used uh, multidextrin in uh, to kind of uh, up the body just a little bit. Uh, but I use Belgian uh, yeast with it, and uh, you really do uh, get to taste that uh, Belgian yeast coming through on a cider, which is just interesting. Speaking of magical graft with Belgian yeast, Grant grabbed us a couple. We're going to give a little quick taste of notes while we finish up this boil. Yeah. Yeah, the nose itself is very much still apple cider dominant, mm -hmm. I, I feel, but it's not as tart. What's interesting is since you use it with the Belgian, you can taste the apple cider you can taste the spiciness of the belgian yeast mm. at play but then that malt is definitely there almost kind of a almost kind of a baki malt yeah yeah baki great head too considering that you didn't use um the wheat but i'm sure that's just being forced carved helps yeah and you can definitely tell uh, taste the tartness though and i think that that really comes through because of the fact that this was made with the canned stuff the concentrated stuff and um, online they say it over and over again too that you get a lot more tart um, uh, tasting of a graph if you're using that stuff as opposed to fresh pressed. As far as the gravity on something like this, uh, what are, what's the final gravity when you're doing graph, have you found? It, it usually is ending below 10, 10, um, 80% of the time. I don't even take gravity readings on this stuff though, just because it's an, it's an easy batch to make and I know what it's going to taste, uh, taste like eventually. But if I'm changing up the uh, recipe and stuff, it, it's usually uh, ending just below 10, 10. That residual sweetness is there from a cider that should end below 1.000. This is obviously leaving a little bit more yeah, that to warm. counteract the apple tartness or at least that apple dryness. Yep. It's a really weird color. Uh, it's kind of almost green, but uh, it's my first time using this type of cider and uh, I know it's going to taste really good, so I'm okay. But yeah, it looks like black walnut. If I wanted to get this um, in a bottle or on draft as soon as possible, I'd be looking at about a month and a half to be on draft and maybe three weeks past that uh, in a bottle. Um, I like to just use the primary fermenter. I don't put it into a secondary very often. Um, and I, so I just let it kind of ferment in there for a little bit longer. Um, unless of course I'm doing some sort of uh, additions at the end or adjuncts at the end. Then I'll throw it into a secondary. This is good. This is a good drink on a day like this. Mm -hmm. As cold as it is outside, it's got a nice bite to it. It's kind of a it little warming. Up. It's also dangerous though, this stuff, because it is easy to drink. And um, you can really play around, uh, fool around with that uh, starting gravity. And um, you can get batches that, you know, are well over 9% ABV. Totally. Um, and they're just as drinkable. Except for <laughs> a half hour later, you're just like, oh. I really like these things though in the summertime when I'm mowing my lawn. Yeah, it's a good time. Back here in September 2012, it's a year after Grant made that graph. Yeah. There's none left to, uh, to actually show the people, but how did that batch turn out? It turned out really well. Actually, um, used it a lot this summer uh, when I was mowing the lawn, mm -hmm. as I said when I was making it. Mm -hmm. um, but oddly enough, that was actually the clearest batch of graph. Uh, that I've ever had before, and I don't know if that's because I was using fresh pressed cider or. Was it dark? Was it as dark going in or no. uh, coming out as it was in the. I thought it would be a lot darker too because yeah. of the way that the wort wor uh, yeah. worked out, but no, it cleared up and it lightened up too uh, through the fermentation. Um, that must have been just pouring it on top of the cider. You, you can't really control the color of the cider that you're pouring it on top of. You can only control the color of the wort, um, but darker than cider. 
Not as dark as this. No, this is very dark. This is a graph sent to us by a BTV fan a year ago as well. It was brewed by Michael Heath and his buddy James. They live in Indiana. And it was pretty cool. Last year I started kind of putting the feelers out if anybody had made graph before. And this guy sent us two bottles with these pretty swagged out labels. You can see he called it Gunslinger's Graph. He's a big fan. He said he was reading book number six of the Dark Tower series when he came across the Homebrew Talk Brandon O recipe and yeah. all the other recipes and kind of made this one of his own. I think this one's a little bit truer to what the literature says, right? It's Oh it, yeah, big yes. It discusses to that. it as if it's a stout made with apple cider. Yeah. And this guy, uh, Michael and James, they say this is a dry stout. Made this is with exactly what Roland was drinking in the book. Okay. Yeah. So this is an extract version. It's got some Amber LME, some Crystal 120, some Special B, some Smoke Malt, which is coming out very nicely in it. Mm -hmm. Roasted barley and chocolate wheat. Grant thought it kind of was smelled bread-like, chocolatey, bready. I, I get the not smoke as sweet. a little bit. Definitely not as sweet as the um, Brandon O's recipe. Um, heavier body than Brandon O's recipe. A, lo a lot different from the, uh, the stuff that I've been making, but very good, and I like the mouthfeel. This is two gallons of essentially stout wort to three gallons of cider. So he's doing a little more half and half kind of version of this almost mm -hmm. instead of the one gallon. But it just goes to say that when you're making a fictional beverage that doesn't really exist in reality anyway, mm -hmm. you can pretty much do what you want with it. Michael and James get really jiggy with it when they uh, do their all grain version. Um, they did an all grain version. They split half or part of it, put it on apple cider. Then they put half on cranberry juice instead. And then the half, the batch on apple cider, then they broke into one gallon experimentation jugs with other fruits, blackberry, raspberry, plum. So they really took the idea of being inspired by something experimental to heart for sure. Yeah, they should use snozberries. They're so good at fictional you know, drinks, they should use frictional fruits. <laughs> Smurf berry. And Smurf berries, A yeah. Smurf berry graph. Come on, y'all. So I think one of the big things that I find interesting about this is just like watching the internet, the homebrewing community via the internet, mm -hmm. just embrace something, create it, evolve it. I mean, who knows if Stephen King even knows people are doing this. Yeah. I you know. I'd like to think that he doesn't. Okay. And that it's just our own little fan geek culture secret. Before the battery dies, I just want to, I, I fell short on the taste of notes. This is very good. It's roasty, smoky, tart. As it warmed up, it got a little more acidic. Yeah. A little more kind of um, dry, but yet still meaty. Dry and meaty. You go, Mike and James. This episode's been a little discombobulated, but we hope you get the point that experimenting outside of the lines is pretty awesome. Brewing outside the lines is pretty awesome. I want to thank Northern Brewer, the Sugar Daddy a la Supreme. I would like to thank Stephen King. Call me, man, we'll do this. We'll make this stuff for you. Uh, I'd also like to thank the, uh, the internet. Yeah, the internet is something to thank. Speaking of which, actually, uh, I want to thank Brandon O. I don't know who you are, but uh, you have the granddaddy of all graph recipes out there. Everyone's using it. And uh, Brandon O, thank you very much. Brandon O can call us too, man. Yeah, do that. Yeah, so if there's nothing else to do, let's go crack open the second bottle of Graf. All for Graf. Graf for all. Escape video with dogs!